Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Ah, oh, my God, the Lord's prayer. Five elements that are need to be present and effective prayers. First of all, there has to be the presence of a relationship with God. There has to be the presence of a relationship with God. Notice verse 9, he says, our Father. That, that, that statement, our Father, is a statement of relationship. He doesn't say, my God or our God, he doesn't say Yahweh or Elohim, he, he uses Abba, he says our father, because father is a relational term. He's saying, listen, that the way that you have access in your prayer is that you have to have a relationship with God to call him father. Romans 8.16 says that the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons, we are the children of God. And if we are the children of God, then we can call God father well, how do i become a child of god how, how can i call god father you got to put your faith in god's son the lord jesus christ if you confess with your mouth that jesus is lord and believe in your heart that jesus died for your sins and god raised you from the dead then god will adopt you and we can call him father there has to be the presence of a relationship with god and that presence is mediated that, that relationship is mediated by Jesus Christ. But then he says, who art in heaven. Our, our Father who is in heaven. This, this is important because it puts God in a very unique category. He's not like any other father. He, he is in a class and in a place all by himself. And, and this is important because there, there are a lot of people who project the character of their earthly father onto God. And so the way that their earthly father treats them is the way they think that our heavenly father treats us. But God says, don't, don't put me in that category. I'm not like earthly fathers. Even great earthly fathers are nowhere near the father that God is. And so the first element that must be present in your effective prayer relationship with God, But then the second element that must be present in an effective prayer, not, not only a relationship, but reverence for the name of God, reverence for the name of God, our God who art in heaven. Here it is. Verse nine. Hallowed be thy name. This is not merely a statement or an indication that God's name is holy. Jesus is teaching us that part of our prayer is to petition God and ask that God would help make his name holy and reverent. That when we pray, it's effective when part of our motivation and methodology is to pray that God's name would be exalted, that God's name would be magnified, that God's name would take precedence and preeminence in my life. When we pray, we ought to pray that not my name be made great, not my name be promoted, but God's name might be revered, not just in my life, not just in my community, but throughout the whole world. I'm, I'm reminded in Genesis chapter 11, um, there were a group of people in Shinar that wanted to build a tower that reached all the way up to the heavens. The problem was their motive was to make a name for themselves. Their motivation was to make their name great. And so God confused their language um, because their motive was in the wrong place. They were not concerned about the reverence and the holiness and the sanctification that is due to God's name. First element is you got to have the relationship with God so that you can have access. Amen. You can call on God and God can respond by taking care of his own child. That relationship happens when you put your faith in Jesus. Secondly, you, you've got to have in your prayers reverence for the name of God, that it is holy, it is sanctified, it is set apart, it is to be revered. But not only that, when you pray, thirdly, you ought to pray 
about the reign of God. Notice what he says. He says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 10, your kingdom come. We're talking about the reign of God, R-E-I-G-N, the reign or the rule or the kingdom of God. There, there are two things in play. One, Jesus could be talking about the millennial reign where he will reign on Mount Zion for a thousand years at a time where there's, the rule is righteousness and peace, that, that that's in the future. Or he's talking about the general kingdom of God or the rule of God um, where God's government of heaven is to show up on earth. And that really was God's initial intention for creation uh, that, that we would take the government and the rule of heaven and apply it and rule on earth. That was Adam's assignment. And so when we're praying, we're praying that God's reign, God's kingdom, God's government of heaven would be in operation on earth. This is, this is important because there's really only three rulers. Either God's going to rule, Satan's going to rule, or we're going to rule. And if our prayer is that we rule, then really it's a satanic prayer. Because remember, Lucifer, uh, he didn't want to serve God. He wanted to be God. And so he rebelled. He wanted to rule himself. He did not want to submit himself to the authoritative rule of God. And when we don't want to do it God's way, when we refuse to submit and to yield to the rule of God, which is acting like Satan, which is acting like Lucifer. No, no, we want to pray that God's will would be done, that it would be his eternal purposes that are reigning on the earth, not my selfish desire, not my uh, will be done, but thy will be done. There's the relationship that's necessary for an effective prayer. There's the reverence that's due to God's name. There is the prayer and petition that God would reign on, his will would reign on earth as it is in heaven. Then the fourth thing that is necessary for an effective prayer is you ought to pray for resources. Notice what it says, verses 11 and 12. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive those who we owe, they owe us debts. Um, this is praying for specific resources. Um, you're really praying that God would provide provision. Notice he says daily bread. Um, daily bread is not merely food, but first of all, it means provision in the general sense. That whatever uh, you need God to do for you, however you need God to take care of you, that's what you're praying for. Specific prayer. But please notice Jesus says daily bread. This is significant because he's saying that you ought to focus your attention in your prayer on today. Not tomorrow, but today. Later on in Matthew chapter 6, he says, don't worry about tomorrow. There's enough evil for tomorrow. It'll take care of itself. Fo focus on today. So when you pray, you're praying for very specific resources for the day. Um, daily bread also has a reference to manna and how God on a daily basis rained down manna for his children to sustain them during the wilderness. Here it is. This is when you ought to pray to God for the resources that you need. But, but here it is. If you don't really believe that you need anything, then you won't ask. And if you won't ask, you will not receive. This really is, amen, a statement of dependency, saying the Lord, I can't survive without you. I can't make it through the day without you. Listen, I need your food. I need your shelter. I need your mercy. I need your protection. I, I need your life. I need your care. I need your resources. God is the source of of our provision and he gives resources but ultimately the one that is behind all of our blessings is the Lord 
and you ought to pray, Lord, here's what I need specifically. I need you to make a way for me today. I need you, amen, to give me strength to endure today. I, I need new mercies today. Please notice that in this context of asking for provision and resources, Jesus mentions forgiveness. Because my brothers and sisters, you and I, we need a daily dose of forgiveness. You and I need a daily dose of mercy. That's why Jeremiah says in Lamentations chapter 3 that his mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. We need a daily supply of forgiveness. We need a daily supply of God's mercy. We need God every single day to look beyond our faults and see what we need and not give us what we rightfully deserve. That the prayer, amen, might be different for different people when you're praying for resources. You may not need what somebody else's needs, and so the prayers may not be exactly the same, but everybody has a need. We all are dependent upon God to take care of us. We're like sheep. God is our shepherd. We need the Lord to assist us and help us and to provide for us. I'm headed to my seat, but there's one more thing I got to tell you. There's one more, amen, essential thing that we need to pray effective prayers, not only my brothers and sisters, do we need to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Secondly, not only must our prayers, amen, make God's name reverent. Thirdly, not only must we pray that God's reign would happen on earth as it is in heaven. Fourthly, that we would pray for specific resources. But then finally, that when you pray, you ought to pray for God's reinforcement. Listen to what he says, verse 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Uh, I've said to you before that this word temptation literally means uh, to try, to test, or to prove uh, in a context where there is the potential to sin. It's not God's will to lead us into sin, but he allows us to get into situations and circumstances where uh, we are being tested, and in the testing, the enemy wants to tempt us. What, what, what he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that there's no temptation such as common to man, that the Lord will not make a way of escape for us. He says that I won't suffer, I won't make you suffer more than you are able to handle, but I will provide a way of escape so that you can endure and overcome the temptation. My brothers and sisters, don't, don't go out into the world thinking that you have enough strength and sustenance and wisdom to overcome the wiles of the enemy. You ought to pray every day that God would send reinforcement to give you the strength to overcome the enemy's plans. He comes to steal, kill, and to destroy, and even in this season of the pandemic, there are a lot of people, amen, who are throwing in the towel, who are giving up of hope, some committing suicide, some falling into depression, some just saying, enough, I'm just going to go out there, and if I die, I die, and, 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 and you need to pray that God would send reinforcement. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Don't you understand that God has the power to deliver you from temptation, whatever it is, God has the power, but you've got to pray for his reinforcement. I'm headed to my seat, but I'm reminded of Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. He was praying, and in his prayer, he prayed, first of all, let the cup pass. Lord, if I don't have to die, don't let me die. And God said, no, you're going to have to die. Then Jesus said, well, nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done. He prayed that God's will would be done, that the reign of God, the kingdom of God would come. And so listen to what the Bible says. The moment he prayed that prayer, thy will be done, the Bible says that the angels came and strengthened him. He prayed for power. He prayed for reinforcement. He prayed for strength. And God heard his prayer and gave him the reinforcement needed to finish 
his assignment to finish his journey. And if we're going to pray effective prayers, not only are we praying for food and shelter, but we ought to pray for divine power and strength and reinforcement to be victorious over the enemy. Come on, bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless his name. Glory.